Alex Belzer is a fellow in the Department of Applied Psychology at NYU. Belzer serves as the administrative director of the NYU Psilocybin Cancer Project, a phase two randomized double-blind placebo-controlled crossover study investigating the effect of psilocybin on end-of-life anxiety in patients with advanced cancer. And it's my pleasure to turn you over to Alex right now. Thank you. So about 10 years ago, I was coming to psychedelic conferences. It used to be called Mind States Conferences in San Francisco and in Mexico. And I met Gus, MD, who has uh, been directing our psychedelic psychotherapy training program. And I really think that the work that he's doing to train the psychotherapists that actually sit in the rooms with the patients in this medical model approach is fantastic. And he's been a true friend and mentor to me. A couple of quick disclosures. We do receive funding from Hefter Research. I receive funding from Hefter. We get funding from NYU, and I receive funding as a fellow in the NYU Steinhardt School. What's been great about this approach is that you don't have to do the research alone uh, in, a, in a dark room. You get to work with an amazing team of people, and we've been able to develop this work over time. There's Jeffrey in the upper left corner, Steve Ross, who's our primary investigator, Tony Bossis, who brings amazing palliative care expertise, Gabby Agan Libes, who's our, who just runs the study as it is. We are working on the coattails of Charlie's work at UCLA. We're doing work with people who have a terminal cancer diagnosis or advanced or recurrent cancer, and they have severe anxiety about that cancer. It's a double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. This is the room that we do it in. A nod to Stan Groff and Hubbard before him on designing a treatment milieu that works well to facilitate a profound experience. We spent a lot of time thinking about how to create not only the physical space, but the emotional space for people to do deep and profound work. All of our patients work with what's called a therapist dyad of two individuals. When they're admitted to the study, they're paired with this therapist dyad. They develop a therapeutic relationship and rapport with the therapist team over the arc of the entire study. They receive at least nine counseling sessions with their team, both before, during the dosing sessions, and then in integration sessions afterward. I'd like to jump right to the actual work. I'm going to introduce a, a, a patient's narrative. I work as a psychotherapist, and uh, I recently finished, um, almost finished my completion of the study with NYU. I was diagnosed uh, five years ago with a type of lymphoma uh, that was untreatable. And not only was it untreatable, but everybody who had had it had died from it. It was aggressive. And um, also, uh, there were no trials going on in the whole country. So that was a lot to handle. Uh, always in my life, I've been an anxious person. And um, naturally, when I was given that diagnosis, um, my anxiety shot up. And even though years and years and years keep going by and I'm still OK, I know very well uh, that this could return at any moment. I worked on myself very strongly not to feel sorry for myself, uh, to say to myself uh, the most positive things I could, which was, um, even though nobody else has made it, it's possible I could make it. Uh, that's about as positive I as I could come up with. I really went to work on myself uh, because I thought that uh, if I were going to die much sooner than I had planned, um, then I wanted to understand myself better. I wanted to understand spirituality better. I wanted not to have a bitter heart. Um, and I wanted to be open. So I did what I could for the past five years. And um, now this study came along. I read about it I, online, and I think it might have been in salon.com, something like that. And um, I read it once, and then I closed it, and then I read it again, and I said, I qualify for that. So I traveled down to New York City for an initial screening interview. I traveled down to New York City uh, several times for psychotherapy sessions with my two psychiatrists. Um, Jeff Gus and Seema Desai. Uh, then they were with me during, um, during the dosing, both dosings, and they've also continued to do psychotherapy with me. 
the sessions take place at um, NYU, and um, they've done a really good job in making, um, I guess, what was once an exam room into a pretty comfortable living room kind of room. There's a uh, couch and um, flowers and books, and uh, it seems not study-like. And um, you go in two sessions. One is a placebo and one is the real plant. Uh, you don't know which is which. Um, so it's two, I happened to have the placebo first, so I went for a sec second session seven weeks later. I got uh, to the study about 8.30 in the morning. Um, at about nine o'clock, um, I was given uh, the pill. Um, I, uh, we had a, a, Jeff and Seema uh, had a wonderful ritual um, with the three of us um, intending for how that day would go, which I thought was lovely. I also asked if I could read a poem and, um, and play a song that really moved me and I thought would set an attention uh, for the day too. You're advised to wear eye shades and lie down on a couch uh, because uh, the object is to go inward. Um, you know, having mentioned that I had taken psychedelics in my 20s, uh, the whole object was to see how beautiful nature was, to hear how wonderful music was, um, to see what, what could be seen, uh, to touch what could be touched. So this was very, very different. And um, because the whole thing that I was going to be experiencing was my own mind. And my expectation was when I took that pill that somehow um, I would see God, that I would, I would touch a, a level of spirituality and um, that my life would be changed. And what happened first and actually lasted much of the day was that I experienced great anxiety. And um, I experienced it as physical. And I saw... I began to see that it was actually a level of my mind. And underneath that, um, I also began experiencing great uh, emotional pain. And it seemed to me that that pain was the pain of suffering people on the earth and also the pain of the earth itself. And I felt... I was actually feeling that I was um, holding the pain of the world in some way, and in particular, um, because I had been listening to uh, Black Spiritual, I felt, I, I could hear uh, the pain in that woman's voice who was singing the song, and it brought to me the whole, um, the whole gestalt of slavery and, and what that is to pull people out of their homes and take them here to this country and, and treat them like animals. And I, I, I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed uh, because of that. And the, um, the ability to just be held by my mentors and do that greatly, um, greatly relieved me. The worst pain and the worst fear and the worst anxiety turned into something that has opened which is the most precious thing I've ever known. And I, um, I, I, to think I wouldn't have known it. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I wouldn't have known it. It was a sense of, I wish I could put it into words, but a, a sense of a, a, a connectedness uh, that runs through all of us uh, that I never knew. And also a sense of, um, of uh, the strength of it and the power of it. I, I now, looking back, it's been four weeks, three and a half weeks, um, I think part of my anxiety was the awe of that. It, it was as if this spirit that I had hoped to connect to was so much bigger and stronger than I had ever imagined. I was quaking in my boots. What Jeff had mentioned to me was that the lessons um, will, so, some, something I took away from what he said was that the lessons that you know intellectually this day will uh, take root in your heart and, um, and you'll grow to know them that way. And that's exactly, exactly what happened because the fear, as it decreased, um, transformed itself into... Uh, 
um, this open heart which was able to receive these the, these lessons um, you know um, so who would have thought you know, the other day when I was meditating I um, I had this uh, feeling coming over me and the thought was of compassion for myself you know that touches me the most it's that's such a gift you know I I have um, I was born with the ability to feel compassion for other people um, I was uh, loved very much by my grandmother and that that I think that opened up my compassion for others. Uh, so I, I'm very grateful for that. But um, I, I have not been a person to feel compassion for myself. Um, I hold myself to a high standard and I judge myself pretty critically. And um, to have that moment of grace where uh, I was just, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm I'm okay. It's all right. Uh, I just I can't put it in words, but I'm so grateful and touched and shocked, <laughs> and it's lasted. It's lasted. So I think that it will bring more changes. Somebody called me up today, and they said, "How are you?" And I said, "Wonderful." And I am 65 years old, and I have never. I just heard that coming out of my mouth. I have never said that. Never. And um, that's how it's been with the people that I'm closest to, that I was already uh, closest to. Uh, I'm having much more fun. Um, my husband, we're just laughing more. We danced in the kitchen in the morning the other day. I mean, just wonderful things. Um, my daughters, who I don't see, but they're on the phone, you know, they're, they're commenting they're expecting me to get very serious about some of the, our issues, and then when I just laugh about it, they just, they're really happy about that. You know, since, since restarting working as a therapist, um, I've been uh, feeling that, oh, how should I put it? Boy, I know I could help these people more if they could go through something like I went through. Um, I feel... Uh, that it is such a boon to learning about yourself, A, learning about yourself, seeing your mind, and, and three, uh, getting in touch with your spirituality. And I just know that if, if, if in the future this could be used with all patients um, under the direction of mentors, shamans, psychotherapists, it would make for a much happier world. You know, to uh, be very trite, I kept that expression, um, the family of man kept on going through my mind, has been going through my mind since, um, since that day, that dosing. And I see it in a way, if people could know how connected they really are, connected to spirit and connected to each other and connected to nature and, if people would know that there, so much of their fear would dissipate, so much of their ang anxiety would dissipate, and um, I, I, I just hope and pray that this, uh, these studies um, will continue and open up the field. I want to commend her for her courage uh, and for opening up and sharing her story with all of us today. And I also want to thank Patrick H. Murphy, who is our volunteer filmmaker who put that together for us. You can see why I'm involved with this work. It's profoundly meaningful, um, and it has its own intrinsic rewards. I want to share with you some of the anecdotal results. In our study, we're looking at uh, an N of 32, meaning we want to do 32 patients. It says here 14 have received one dose of psilocybin, but in, but in fact, just yesterday, we had uh, the first dosing session on, with our 15th subject. The data have yet to be formally analyzed, but all of our subjects have improved clinically according to the reports of their therapists, some dramatically so, both acutely and sustained. There's been decreased in death anxiety, as well as depressive mood, both of which are primary outcome variables in our study. According to reports from the patients and from their family members, there's been improved interpersonal and family functioning as well as a reported increase in spiritual states. 
half of our patients have had a profound mystical or mystical type experience. And there's also been really important autobiographical effects of people doing life memory results. Charlie was talking about the patient's salient memory and having some sort of profound impact upon his or her experience. All the patients have been interested in taking additional doses, although our study, you only get one active dose uh, with a psilocybin and one dose with an active placebo. And one of the patients reported, quote, I feel now that I have my driver's license and I want more help. So I want to invite everybody in the room to go on a little time travel journey with me. We're in Judson Memorial Church, it's 2012. So shut the door in the back, suit up. The whole church is gonna go back 50 years to 1962. What was happening in 1962? 50 years ago, it's sort of the heart of what we consider the classical age and the modern era of psychedelic research. There's over a thousand clinical papers published on psychedelics. You're midway through the Concord prison experiments up in Massachusetts with Tim Leary and Ralph Metzner. You're also exactly to this year celebrating uh, the Marsh Chapel experiences with Walter Pankey up at Cambridge and Harvard, Harvard Divinity School, where he gave mushrooms to 10 uh, divinity school students. I think that we owe a huge debt to the work that of the research in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s. But the critique of that research, let's take a look at the broader research agenda about what questions are we asking, how are we asking them, what is our method, and how might our method be improved? The critique of that work was that there was not very much blinding. In fact, in the Concord Prison Experiments, the graduate students and the prisoners would take mushrooms in the morning together, and then the other half would take mushrooms in the afternoon together. Everyone, knowed, everyone knew who was taking the active dose. And in the Marsh Chapel experiments, as amazing as the study was, of the 10 subjects, one of the subjects had a really profoundly challenging experience and, ha and got up and left the chapel in the middle of the work and ran down the road. They had to, to go and restrain him, administer a tranquilizer. And unfortunately, the researcher, Walter Pankey, whose measure we still use for evaluating mystical type experiences, didn't report that, omitted that in the write-up, and it's only come out later. Now this sort of omission, this sort of researcher bias is, is almost unthinkable today. But I, I think that it, there's, a, there's a long history of that. And so the work today has been scrupulously methodological, tight uh, research, tight controls. We've had amazing blinding uh, protocols. But if we were now to go into 2062, the time machine travels forward 100 years, and look back at the research that we're doing today, the question I have for everyone in the room, where are the movers and the shakers and the people that are thinking critically about this work? What is it about our time and our place and the way that this research is funded and the goals of the research that may manifest a researcher bias in what we're asking and how we know what we know? So I'm working with Carol Gilligan at NYU. She's a well-known psych psychologist, and she suggested make a list and I invite you all to do this on a sheet of paper now or later. We probably don't have time at this point, but on the one half of the paper, write down a list of what we know about psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy, what we know about psilocybin. And on the other half, make a list of what we don't know, the mystery of it, but what we want to learn and what can be known. Here's my list. We know that psilocybin grows naturally on the six inhabited continents of the Earth. We know that it has been used for shamanic and ritual use dating back to prehistory. We know that psilocybin is not like other drugs. We know that it is profoundly meaningful. Two-thirds of users in the Roland Griffiths study say that their work with psilocybin was amongst the top five most meaningful experiences of their lives, putting it on par with the birth of a child, getting married to their spouse. We know that psilocybin can occasion mystical type or mystical experiences. We don't really know what that means, but we know that it can do that according to our criteria. We know that psilocybin can lessen anxiety. We know that psilocybin can help you stop smoking. We know that psilocybin can help cure cluster headaches, which are debilitating. We know that it can occasion profound soulful, spiritual, emotional experiences. We also know that psilocybin is a prohibited substance. We know that we live in a time of prohibition, the question becomes, how do you conduct research in a time like this? And much of the research is within the framework of a symptom reduction framework. 
People have a psychopathology, they have tremendous anxiety, they have PTSD, they may have OCD, they have depression, they have other sorts of psychopathology, and to alleviate their symptoms and to treat them, we can administer this medicine. What if we move on to the question of, we don't know, but we want to learn? What is this mystical experience? Jeffrey and I have been talking about it as the mystical black box. There's the patient, they walk into the room, they have this amazing experience, they experience the oneness and the inevitability of all experience, and they walk out and then they're different. What happens in this black box? Here is a list of all of the reliable validated measures that we use. It's an amazing study, and we get baseline measures at the beginning, and then up until six months follow-up, we're following these primary outcome measures. But my question is, are we measuring the right things? What is the model of change? in the individual. People are healed, people are transformed, but in what ways and how, and how do we account for that? So there may be other unknown factors that we're not even asking about. What about the importance of emotional catharsis? What about, what, what if there's some turning point with forgiveness? Forgiveness of oneself, forgiveness of somebody who's wronged you in your life, forgiveness of your mother or your father. What if there's some third factor that we haven't even thought about that we're not even measuring? And so, my concern with the research, and I think it's fantastic, is that maybe the cart's gotten a little ahead of the, hor of the horse. Uh, and we'll get to that later with a proposal for augmenting our, our, our methodology. What else don't we know but we want to learn? We don't really know, and we have uh, wonderful reports on Arrowwood. I advise you all to, to donate to Fire and Earth's fantastic archivist project but we don't know how patients make sense of their experience. We don't know that in the clinical peer-reviewed literature. We don't know what it means to them. We know that it's meaningful, but we don't really have a deep sense of that. Our work has primarily been nomothetic, which means that we're moving across cases. We do an analysis across many subjects, as opposed to ideographic, which means that you work with one case and go deeply into the experience. And those are two different research approaches that I think we need to be able to do both in this form of research. Then there's the issue of personality and one's character. You know, Aldous Huxley said he believed that only the cognizanti of every age, the, the writers, the thinkers, the musicians, that these people should be given this sacred medicine, as, as they saw it, but not everybody else. And oftentimes, I'm not a member of the clinical team, but people talk about patients in a way where they're, they're saying, well, you know, this patient, we're, there's an implicit question, is, is the patient ready for the psilocybin assisted psychotherapy, or maybe the patient's not quite ready. And the question is, like, what does that mean? What are we saying about the subject? Is there something having to do with their personality or their, their place on a path, or is a clinician's hunch? But maybe we need to unpack that and explore that a little bit deeper. Maybe people who have particular personality tendencies, like narcissism or paranoia, maybe these people should not be taking psychedelic, psycho, uh, psychedelics within the, uh, the therapy module that we're talking about. And then we come to the question of harms and the shadow side of things. What are the harms? Charlie did an amazing talk about this, but you know, two of the uh, patients in uh, the original Healthy Normal study at Hopkins reported that they had profoundly challenging experiences, that they felt embattled for a significant portion of the work. And so we need to look deeply into the harms. This is a multi-level phenomenon. It is cognitive, behavioral, emotional, psychodynamic, spiritual, existential, and experiential components. Because it's a multi-level phenomenon, we need to think about a multi-level approach. And eventually, you know, we start bumping up against the mystery of all of this. So I come to you today with an invitation and a proposal. The invitation is for us, if you look around the room you did earlier, who are the people in here? Some of us just walked in off the street, we're undergraduates at NYU, we live locally. Many people here, though, are the movers and shakers in the research field and the future movers and shakers, the shapers of our common destiny. And so I encourage us to think about a mixed methods approach to doing this research in the peer-reviewed literature. We need to do a grounded theory look in the patient's experience. I think that there's an amazing value, too. You saw, the, you saw Estelin's fantastic testimony, the patient-driven experience, these in, an in-depth interview process can get at that experience, can elicit that information from the patient and share it with the world. And that can be analyzed on a case-by-case -case individual basis, but it can also be analyzed across many different cases. We need to look at the patient's, hear the patient's voice and get at their deep experience 
And we need to ask about the process of meaning and sense-making creation. So I'm here to propose a complementary interview study and a series of studies looking at this. If we want to understand the models for change about how this happens, we need to ask how does healing occur? And you know, there's two approaches. One is a research saturation approach where you go in with an a priori hypothesis, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy in anxious individuals will cause a, a decrease in their anxiety. And we're gonna, we can test that with strict methodological controls. But you do that when you understand what's going on, and we do in large measure here, but there's also something called a research discovery approach. And the research discovery approach says we actually don't really know a lot about what's happening here. So we can go in, conduct these interviews, do the work, and that in turn generates testable hypotheses for later investigation. So within the symptom reduction framework, I think that that's an amazing framework to work within. It has powerful healing capacity. But we also need to augment that and complement that to build a broader rationale for psychedelic research and therapies. Finally, you know, these, these patient voices are powerful. They, they do a much better job than statistics of conveying the complex psychospiritual experience and the inner phenomenological experience in a way that you know, our quantitative data may not. These stories have the power to inform, they have the power to persuade, they have the power to change the discourse in the media, as well as clinical, regulatory, and academic circles. I, I really believe that they have the power to inform our own practices, change our minds, and to touch our hearts. But I just want to you know, step out of our time machine back into 2012, back into Judson Memorial Church in this beautiful square. We are the shapers of our common destiny. And I don't think that we ought to let a regulatory framework and the hurdles of that framework, because we're working with a Schedule One drug, constrain the questions that we ask, how we ask them, and the methods that we employ. Thank you. How do you obtain and how do you guarantee the quality of your research material? Why doesn't Big Pharma involve in the research grants since they could make a lot of money? We have to work with a Schedule One license, our pre-IS Schedule One license. We contracted out with an organic chemistry lab in Connecticut called Organics, which we keep, by the way, in a 600-pound safe with reinforcements under the floor. And there's actually not a lot of money to be made in this. Most big pharma companies have privileged use of a particular compound that is approved by the FDA, that's used in psychotherapy, um, or in some sort of pharm pharmacological intervention. Um, but the problem is that psilocybin can't, you know, it, it's, it's, an, it's a naturally occurring compound, and so they can't make money off of it. There's actually been a lot of, look, a lot of uh, research looking at taking LSD, for example, which, where, where they don't have that uh, ability and, and turning it into, uh, uh, you know, changing the compound slightly so that you have a, that, that big pharma can have actually an experience like that. The, the problem that we're having is that most of the funding we get has to come from private donors, and we have an amazing private donors who have been funding this research over time. It's a phase two trial, but we have to fund a phase three trial in order to take it to the next step, which would be proving that it's an efficacious and effective intervention in this population for a treatment modality. Then after that, we can start looking at Schedule 1 to Schedule 2 rescheduling. It's not really my bailiwick, though. I'm just wondering about the subject selection process. We didn't review the inclusion and exclusion criteria, but all of our subjects um, have to have a diagnosis of anxiety, uh, acute stress disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, or anxiety disorder due to cancer, and they also must have a potentially life-threatening, advanced, or recurrent cancer diagnosis. But they have to be—they um, have to have a projected life expectancy of at least one more year, because the actual entire arc of the therapy can last nine nine months. Um, so you know, there's there's also a number of exclusion criteria. There are a number of medical and uh, neuro neurological issues that can exclude somebody, including high blood pressure. They can't be on SSRIs. Um, they can't have a current substance abuse disorder. They can't be taking medicine that has contraindications. Uh, and they can't be, be pregnant or, or breastfeeding. You spoke kind of highly about our current research methodologies as much better than 50 years ago. How many people were able to accurately guess whether they got the psilocybin or the placebo? Uh, I actually don't have the figures on that. 
we haven't evaluated them formally yet, so I hope to get that information to you soon, but we don't know is the answer to that. Yeah. The, the, pro the problem is that all of our, we, we don't, the blind is, is in effect until the end of the study, so we actually don't know which substance they're using. Um, Your intuition on that? Oh, I, I. He's I, asking? Well, the, the, Rick, it's an excellent question. I'm actually not a member of the clinical team. My, my experience in talking with the clinicians is that they believe they know when somebody's had the active dosing session, or the, the psilocybin session versus the active placebo. Um, but my understanding is that in the Hopkins study with healthy normals that up to 20%, something like 20% of the time, the clinician wrongly thought that the person was having the psilocybin session when in fact they were having a placebo session. What is your role exactly? It's a good question. My title is administrative director, but I've been a jack of all trades, master of none throughout the study. Um, Jeffrey, Gus, Steve Bosses, uh, Tony Bosses rather, and Stephen Ross, and I started a reading group six years ago. We wanted to read all the seminal articles in psychedelic research. My role since then has been, I've, I've lectured in some of the educational work that Jeffrey Gus has done. I've played a cheerleader to the team, which I think has been important in some ways. Uh, and then in my own personal path, I'm just beginning a doctoral work in psychology. So I haven't seen patients yet. I've not worked in a clinical capacity. Um, and I hope one day to be able to do psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy research, both in a study, but also hopefully in, in, the, you know, in, in a general practice one day. You know, we also have an amazing website, nyucanceranxiety.org, uh, which I encourage you all to visit. Um, and, you know, I've... There's a lot of things that have to happen. A lot of it has to do with orchestration of people and places and things. So I've, it's been an amazing experience. The work itself has really, it's been close to my heart. And um, I struggled for a long time with what to do with my life. I feel like I've really found a home with the team there. I feel like uh, I'm learning more than I would in any other practice. And I'm so excited to be doing research that's not drop dead boring. So, I was really interested in the distinction you made between the research discovery and research saturation. Dr. Rick Strassman, his explanation for why he halted his DMT study was because he felt like he didn't have an overarching theory. I was wondering if you had any opinion on his reason for exiting his study based on that distinction. Right, so like if you land in new territory, you send scouts out across the island to sort of chart the generic contours of the land before you start in one particular area and, and zero in right on that area. And I feel like because of the regulatory framework, we're encouraged to do hypothesis testing with particular psychopathologies and do you know, highly regulated uh, control trials, which is, which is helpful because I think that there's enough literature to support with patients who have anxiety about death and dying, a psilocybin approach. But I think it's important, like with Rick's trial, we do, we, we contour the entire island, including the shores. Uh, and, the, you know, one of the things I wanted to bring up here is that if you look around the room, the, peop the people in here are quite, many of us are quite young. Uh, I'm probably one of the junior members in, in the whole discipline. It's been uh, an exciting experience to learn from people who've been doing this work much longer than I have. Uh, but I, I, you know, if, if I can do it, everybody can contribute in some way. And, People are. I just feel like there's a blossoming of this experience. You know, I applied to doctoral programs. I did put my work in the psilocybin study on my CV, but I didn't talk it up in the interviews. Tenured professors had very different approaches to that. They, some of them said, oh, really, psilocybin? Some of them kind of gave me a little look and then moved on. Many of them just sort of had a blank stare and said, okay, great. NYU psilocybin work, okay, great, 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 you know, and so there was just a complete not reading into what, uh, what was going on because I had other work that they were looking at. But I encourage everybody to think about how this work may play into their path. It's a broad path and we can all walk down it together. It's very, very different today. And my advice to any students in, in the room are be excellent. If you have a four point from a great institution, you can write your own ticket. And, and I think people can contribute in many ways. And, I, I think we all owe some debt of gratitude. I owe a debt of gratitude to the work that Charlie and Neil, Rick Doblin at MAPS, board at Hefter, because they've laid the groundwork. It's been a labor of love. Except for a couple of staff positions, everyone who's been working on our trial has done so in a completely 
volunteer basis, volunteering hundreds, thousands of hours of their time. It's not something that people are doing for a dime, they're doing it because it means something intrinsically to them.